Okay. All right, thanks. Don't you know it's time to praise the Lord in the sanctuary of his Holy Spirit? So set your mind on him and let your prayers begin and the glory of the Lord will fill his place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He lives within the praises of his people. He loves to hear us call upon set your mind on him and let your praise begin and the glory of the Lord will fill his place praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Good morning. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Wave those palm branches. I just want to let you know something. Um, our opening song right now is 297, and you probably noticed the screen went up instead of down because it's not working. So you have these lovely green books in front of you. They're called a hymn book, <laughs> and they, they're filled with all these wonderful songs. And so the first one we're doing this morning is number 297, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. So those of you in the front row, look behind you. I'm sure you can find a book behind you. seated. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Start waving with me, you guys. I'm sorry. They only had a few. You might want to work, call to worship sometime so you too can have a full palm. But it doesn't matter. It's about the heart. Welcome to Palm Sunday here at Grace Community Church in Surprise, Arizona. I'm Claudia Kell, and I am so excited to worship with you, and I also am excited that there are people who choose to be online because they cannot be present. 
So we got palms for a reason. Not only are they gonna get our grace-filled smile, but let's give them a wave with the palms. Please turn around and let them know. It is Palm Sunday, we are celebrating. Woohoo! Yay, God. If you're new at Grace Community Church, we have a card that's in front of you. Also, we should have pencils there. We would love for you to fill out a card and drop it in the offering box as you leave. It's a way to get to know you before we really, truly understand how present you are with us. There's also a gift bag. We like to leave people with a little bit of a keepsake being here at uh, Grace Community. So please help yourself to a gift bag. Now, please plan on attending our combined Maudie Thursday with Tenebrae service. It's this Thursday. This Thursday, the 28th, it's at 5 p.m. We would love to fill the chairs because this is the beginning of Holy Week. It doesn't stop today. It keeps going. Please plan also um, that next Sunday is our Resurrection Sunday. It's what we live for. It's what gives us life. And if you are a member here at Grace Community and have been here for a while, you know that we have an amazing cross that's a frame. And so we ask members, please bring flowers. Please bring the beauty of creation that God has given us. And we are going to fill that cross with flowers. And that cross sits outside. And people who drive by are enhanced by the beauty of the cross. So now let's take a moment. Let's speak love into each other just as Christ would. That means greet one another. Y'all stand up. <laughs> You know, what would we do if we didn't have someone covering our backs? So I am like, hey, we're community members here. We know when it's time to love on each other. Apparently, we need Pastor Cliff here to remind us because some of us are trained not to do anything unless we've been told. Uh-oh, uh-oh. You know what? We're supposed to do this responsive reading. Yeah. It's you perfect. know, we, we always do this, right, yeah, for the call to worship. You know what the good part is? What's that? All I have to do is teach them a good sentence, strong sentence. Oh, please. And you guys get to repeat back. That's how simple today was. So you know what? If Satan wanted to take out Palm Sunday on us, we're Didn't not it. letting him. We're going to learn the phrase. You're going to repeat after me, and this will be the signal to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Does that work, Pastor Cliff? Perfect. All right. What I'd love for you to learn is very simple. The first part goes, Hosanna to God. You ready? Hosanna, Hosanna to, to God. God. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the, the highest. highest. And this is the hardest part for most of us. It's not just with your voice worshiping God today. It's also raising your hand to the skies and waving that palm branch. Okay. <laughs> So I will work really hard at not lifting until it's your turn. <laughs> All right, let's come to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. 
Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. And all who fear God say, his love endures forever. Hosanna to God. Hosanna in the highest. When the Lord on when the, with the Lord on our side, what can we fear? What can others do to harm us? Hosanna to God! Hosanna in the highest! We shall triumph over those who surround us and stand in confidence in the Lord our God. Hosanna to God! Hosanna in the highest! The Lord is our strength and our might. The Lord has become our salvation. Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everyone, Hosanna to God, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Claudia. Um, you, most of you have been given a sheet of paper that has the hymn that we're going to sing right now. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. If there's someone next to you that didn't get one, share, please. Oh, if, or raise your hand if you need one. Patty still has some in the back. So here she comes. Keep your hand up if you need a copy. Go ahead, Sherry, with the introduction. going to need your hymn book back 296 and then 299 296 hosanna and then 299 in the name of the lord we're doing both verses hosanna
may be seated. It's fun when we get thrown a curve. Oh, no, that won't do. Excuse me. We've had technical issues. Thank you. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, come on, be corny with me a little bit. Be corny for a minute, but then let it turn to a heartfelt praise of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. It is exciting to be here this morning, and it's exciting for me for a number of reasons. One, I get to welcome my nephew, Christopher Tento. Christopher, would you stand up? That's right. He's Jane's nephew, too. And Christopher, we're glad to have you here all the way from Washington, D.C. He is, I think, 10,232nd to the White House. And, you know, in case there's, isn't that the line of succession? All right, I'm kidding. Uh, no succession there, I'm afraid. But, uh, 
today is, <laughs> he'd do a great job as president. I know him well. <laughs> Friends, uh, today is also a special day because as we celebrate the welcoming of our Lord into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, this is also a day, is this on? Can we turn that off? Oh, yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? Okay, how's that? There we go. I'm a techno disaster area. You know, you add that with the screen issues, and boy, it's a, it's a show. People come here just for the circus. <laughs> Do you know, I'm, not, I'm still not on? Shocking. Now I'm on. No? I don't know how that could be. Well, it says it's on. So we'll just go back to this. Exciting days. <laughs> Sounds like we need some more work on that sound system. New equipment. This is all a contrived thing, you know. Um, we get to welcome, not only or celebrate the welcoming of our Lord into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but we get to welcome a whole bunch of new members today. And uh, it's, it's uh, exciting because we're a part of the body of Christ, and a lot of people don't understand just how important it is to be a part of the body of Christ. So when you say, hey, I want to become a member of the church, you're saying, I'm throwing my hat in the ring. This is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant my feet. This is where I'm going to make a difference. This is the body of believers where I want to grow close in heart at, to, with these people as we worship the Lord. Now, there is a passage in Scripture that I'm always reminded of as we welcome new people in. Maybe you remember, this is ringing in my ears. Is this ringing for you? Oh, well, we're getting a lot of ringing. There we go. Anyway, uh, when Pentecost came and the believers were all together, in, in the, they were waiting for the Lord in prayer, and the Holy Spirit came upon them as tongues of fire. Well, 3,000 people were added to their number that day. And that is, the, that is the pattern of the book of Acts. People were constantly being added because people who are believers, their lives were changed. And when your life is changed by Jesus Christ, you're going out and telling people, amen? amen. And so... Could you imagine if 3,000 people, 3, people converged on us today when our screen isn't working? How could we possibly worship? <laughs> it's amazing. But listen to these words in chapter 2 of, of the book of Acts, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And you know, we are called to be a people who don't just come here, sit like stiff boards, go through a bunch of stuff that we call worship, and then go home. Nope. We are called to get to know one another, to understand each other, to love on each other, and to praise the Lord. That's what we're called to do. And so, friends, I want us today to welcome in the following. Well, I'm not even going to try to name all their names. I'm going to let them name their names. Come on up if you're in our new members class. Come on up. Come on. Oh, good. Pat made it. All right. Come on up here. You can, yeah, stand on the stairs is probably the best thing to do. And Virginia, you don't even have to get on a stair. Just stay right there. Thank you, Patrolman Patty. She's so good. I love that lady. She does so much for us. Friends, I'd like you to uh, just to introduce yourselves. I'm going to put the, I'm going to hand the microphone all the way down here. Just tell us 
Uh, uh, just tell us your name and where you came from before you moved to Surprise. Just um, one place, that is. Go ahead. I'm Pat Cavalcanti. I'm from New Jersey. Jim McNally, Lindenhurst, Illinois. Vasi McNally, Lindenhurst, Illinois. David Grenrud, Colorado. Julie Grenrud, also Colorado. Judy DeLue from Moreno Valley, California. Randy DeLue from Moreno, California. Virginia Phillips from Seattle, Washington. And I want to tell you, my youngest daughter is sitting here in the audience. <laughs> I'm Jan Caputo from New York State. I'm John Caputo from Bath, New York. And Bob Braun from Seattle area, not Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is so good to have these friends with us. And we have been uh, through five weeks of classes, sharing our stories, understanding the purpose of the church, studying the scriptures together, and, uh, and, and really getting a, a, a new vision for what it is to be the church. And as such, we also, uh, we, we end every class by receiving new members, and there are questions that we have already been over that we ask in front of you so that you know these people are legit. These are heavy questions, too. These are heavy questions, so let me ask you. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God and without hope for your salvation except in his sovereign grace? Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and depend upon him alone for your salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now promise and resolve in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live li lives as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? I do. Do you promise to serve Christ in his church by supporting and participating with this congregation in its service of God and its ministry to others to the best of your ability? Do you? I do. Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and to the spiritual oversight of this church session, the elders? And do you promise to, to promote the unity, purity, and peace of the church? Do you? I do. Most of that was robust right up into the submit part at the end, which always scares people. But you know what? It's a gracious submission, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Well, I would like to... Pray for these dear friends, and then I'd like for you, actually, as we pray for these dear friends, I'd like you to stand and just reach your hand out as a way of saying, we're in agreement here. In fact, I'm going to ask you, will you pledge as a congregation to stand with these friends, to love them as Jesus would love them, to serve as Jesus would serve with them, and to honor him in all that we do together as one body, do you? Praise the Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these dear friends. We thank you for this church, and we ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon all of us as your people, and especially as we unite with these friends. We pray that, uh, that the body of Christ would be strengthened, edified, and above all, that your name would be glorified. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would represent uh, his love and light beautifully, powerfully, meaningfully to a world that desperately needs to know him. Lord, we love you and we give you our hearts again now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Your friends, let's welcome this class of new members. And as, as you prepare to sit down, we have a gift for you. Uh, in fact, all of you can sit down, but uh, there's no chocolate in there, honey. I'm sorry, um, but maybe next time. There is a large Bible in there that's a study Bible, 
And it's a, we've, for those of you who are members and have received one of our study Bibles, they stopped printing those, so we had to come up with a new one. And you guys have got a really serious study Bible. I mean, ooh, this is like even bigger than the last one. But we hope and pray that everyone, whether you're a member here at the church or whether you are a, a guest on a regular basis, we hope and pray that you will grow in the Lord Jesus Christ and your understanding of his word because his word is living. And oh man, when it's alive in you, great things begin to happen. Once again, let's welcome these friends. Yes, sir, did you have something to say? Oh, boy. I do. He never tells me ahead of time. We'll give you a personal privilege here, John. Uh, I was very hesitant about uh, joining this membership group, and uh, my wife coaxed me <laughs> into coming. And I'd like to say that it was the best experience I've had in a long time meeting so many new people with the same interest in, in worshiping Jesus Christ. And uh, the big added thing that I, impressed me was that they served dinner at the end of each, uh, well, at the beginning of each session. So if you ate, uh, you could always leave. <laughs> but, Quick, get that microphone away from him. Yeah. <laughs> Now about the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give him another round of applause. Welcome to Grace Community Church. It says in Psalm 147, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Let us pray to our merciful God. O oh Lord, our God, we praise you for your great mercy, steadfast love, and grace. You have given us your only begotten Son to take our nature upon him, himself becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. We confess our unworthiness and our faith in his precious sacrifice. As this holy week begins, we cry with the crowd, Hosanna, Lord Jesus, save us. May we always remain faithful. Together we pray for our country, save us from crime, inflation, and invasion. Guide the president, courts, and Congress. Uphold your church as we observe the passion, death, and glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep all worshipers safe. We pray for the peace in the Holy Land, along with the safe release of the hostages. We pray for healing for those who were wounded in that massacre in Moscow this past week. We ask for unity in the church universal and growth in the church locally. Bring healing and relief to the sick and afflicted of this congregation and to all whom we name personally in our prayers. Please hear us now as we pray in the name of Jesus, his prayer saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this Palm Sunday comes from the 24th Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall send the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. And be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. 
Our gospel lesson for today comes from the 21st chapter of the book of Matthew, the traditional Palm Sunday reading. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and Jesus sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Here ends our readings for today. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, bud. I think I'm on. Miracles do happen. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Come on, you can do. Now look, all of so many, I'll bet you what, how many people here went to Sunday school as a kid? How many people here celebrated Palm Sunday as a kid? Come on, you are just grown up kids. Wave those palms and say it. Hosanna in the highest. Glory to God. I hope you do too. Oh boy, there's always something, isn't there? And today we're hitting it on all cylinders in terms of my techno disaster area. I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I remember some of, some of the early days of celebrating Palm Sunday. And there was a tradition in the church where, I fir- where we first went as a family at the First Presbyterian Church in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, well, good old Wilkes-Barre. Well, that sanctuary is a gorgeous sanctuary, soaring stained glass windows and this pipe organ that can't be beat. And I just will never forget, it probably was 1965, I was four or five years old, and, uh, and the, the, the pipe organ started the service in such a powerful way that I felt it through my whole little body. And, and they sang every Palm Sunday, they'd start the service with, lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, lift them up. And, and, and it wasn't just... The, the rafter sat, rattling sound of the organ that was so cool. I remember the first time I saw this, there was a man that came down the aisle sitting on a, what I thought was a horse, and, uh, and he had a beard, and, and, he, and he was wearing some strange clothes. I mean, literally, they had a man dressed like this on a donkey. Just think if that donkey had a problem. It was just... I was concerned about that. No, I wasn't. I was in awe. And as this hymn was thundering out, this donkey came in with this man, and it was followed by rank upon rank of different choirs, starting with the youngest and going all the way to the oldest. And they were all waving their palms because moving from lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, it was all glory, laud, and honor. And it, it was a wonderful day. At one point, I looked up at my dad and I said, who's the man on the horse? And he says to me, son, that's Jesus. And it isn't a horse, it's a donkey. I couldn't believe it. The, the real Jesus was right there riding on a real donkey. I waved my palm so furiously that I hit the lady in front of me and my dad immediately took me down from where I, he had lifted me up so I could see the whole thing. I was thunderstruck. I was just amazed by this whole spectacle. And 
I, I can only imagine. And that was just us coming together for worship. Could you imagine that first Palm Sunday when Jesus Christ was entering Jerusalem? There must have been noise everywhere, the crowd shouting and cheering. Remember, people knew who he was. Word had gotten around, and, and many had seen the miracles, the signs that he had uh, produced and, and shown people. The, they'd heard the things that he said. They were amazed by the, the things that, that came from his mouth because they were unlike what the Pharisees and the scribes were, were teaching. I mean, the crowd must have just been as curious as could be. They must have moved forward. They must have pushed forward. They must have wanted to see more and more uh, what was happening. We read that people actually tore off their cloaks and threw them on the ground as he came into the city. And, and, and others were scrambling up trees to pull down branches. Children lined the streets, waving their victory palms and singing, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest and, and then they, they saw the king himself a man on a donkey a symbol of royal authority coming in peace I mean grabbing the nearest elbow they pointed to the gentle rider and, and demanded who is this man the crowds answered this is Jesus that's what happened on the first Palm Sunday according to Matthew 21 the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And one of the things that I had hoped to show you on the screen today was a little map of Jesus' journey because he went into Jerusalem and on into where the temple is. And so here we have this picture of Jesus, humble and riding on a donkey. But there was something else that was happening that very same day. and Something that most of us who are familiar with Palm Sunday probably didn't know about because while Jesus was making his way into Jerusalem and on into to the temple, the priests in the temple were praising God. And one of the, the, the psalms that they would have said on that day of the week, according to the ancient rabbis, the priests would be reciting Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord strong in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of of glory. Selah. So the people in the streets and the priests in the temple were asking the same question. Who is this king? The, the people said it was Jesus. The priests on the other hand said it was the Lord Almighty. And in a way that nobody could understand in that moment, they were both right because Jesus is the Almighty Lord. He is the King of glory. Psalm 24, the, the song of the glorious King is divided into three stanzas. And I'm kind of, this outline I picked up from Philip Rankin and I, 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 Reichen, and I really appreciate it. But he divides it in three stanzas. Some scholars say that, oh, these are three different poems. But as we will see, these three stanzas belong together. And the first praises the Lord as creator, verses 1 and 2. The second receives him as the Savior, verses 3 through 6. And the third welcomes him as king, verses 7 through 10. I, you know, I see some people with Bibles open. I hope that you all bring your Bibles. In the future, bring your Bibles, because you need to open them up and follow along, because we usually stick with the Bible around here. I usually am not reading from Khalil Gibran or you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran or something like that. We study the Bible here. So I hope that you bring your Bibles and you keep your Bibles open to where we're studying. But this question is answered, who is the King of Glory, right here in Psalm 24. 
It's not certain when Psalm 24 was written, but I think we can make a pretty educated guess as to when that actually happened. The psalm is about God making a royal entrance into the holy city. Therefore, most scholars think that it was written when David first brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. The Ark, as some of you may remember, was this sacred golden chest that represented God's presence with his people. It it was... It had been fashioned in the days of Moses, according to Exodus 25. Inside were two uh, stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments, uh, God's covenant with his people. And on top of this was the mercy seat where the priest, the high priest, would sprinkle the, the blood of atonement. The Ark of the Covenant had, had often brought people the people of God, victory in battle. It it led them across the Jordan. It brought down the walls of... Some of you are still listening. And yet, when the Israelites stopped trusting in God in 1 Samuel 4, the ark was captured by the Philistines, the arch enemy of God's people. It was captured. And, and, And they soon discovered just how dangerous it is to live in the presence of a holy God. You see, when the Philistines started dying from disease, they were quick to ship the ark back to Israel. Please, you know, take this thing that's worse than COVID-19. For, for, for a time, the ark of God remained at the house of a guy named Abinadab. But once his kingdom was settled, David decided that he would bring it up to Jerusalem The problem was that the ark was almost as dangerous for the Israelites as it had been for the Philistines. Some of you may remember that during the journey in 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 7, we're told a man named Uzzah reached out to study, to study, to steady the ark so that it wouldn't tip over. And what happened to him? He was killed instantly. Some of you have been studying. That's good. I mean, really? At at that point, it seemed safer to leave well enough alone. So for several months, the ark remained at the house of a guy named Obed-Edom. When David saw that God was blessing Obed-Edom, he again decided to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And that may have been the occasion for the writing of this Psalm 24, which ends with God entering the holy city, the the, the time in Israel's history when God made the royal entrance was when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem. And so the psalm begins by praising God as the master of the universe, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it Upon the waters. These verses are interesting. They assert God's absolute ownership of everything that there is. Who owns that shirt? Not you, Randy. God does. Who owns that cane? Not you, Virginia. God does. Who owns your wallet? Oh, we knew you'd get there sometime, Pastor. You know, God does. We're, we're, we're just here as managers, friends. But this asserts that everything, everything, the lights, the skies, the everything, the rocks, the trees, the birds, the bumblebees, they all belong to God. Everything in the world. All the, even all those silly spiritual vortexes up in uh, Sedona. I mean, all of this belongs to God. For he claims authority over everyone who lives in the world. I don't know if any of you have ever read a guy, uh, he was a Dutch uh, theologian. How many people here read Dutch theologians? Anybody? Uh, Some some of us have, but there's there's an old Dutch theologian and statesman back in the 1800s. His his name was Abraham Kuyper, and he once wrote, in the total expanse of the human life, there is not a single square inch of which Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare, that is mine. On what basis 
does God claim such absolute authority? He claims it on the basis of creation. I, my goodness, the earth belongs to the Lord because he made it, he founded it, he established it. He is also the king. God's power in creation gives him the right to rule over everything that he's made. Is he the ruler of your heart? Some of you can't say that. Some of you don't yet believe. Some of you haven't yet submitted your hearts to the Lord. But that's the truth. Even those who are stubborn, stiff-necked, and refuse to accept him as Lord and Savior belong to him. What he does with you, well, that's a different story. This is why it's so important that when we look at the debate over origins, we need to take that very seriously as Christians. When people disagree about the origin of the species uh, or about the beginning of the world, they're not simply arguing about how the universe was made, but about who's in charge. If our God isn't our creator, then he can't be king. I often think of Handel's Messiah at this season of the year. In Handel's day, the alternative was deism. The view that God made the world and he wound it up and he left it to run down on its own. Psalm 24 answers by saying that God is ruling the universe at this very moment. This very moment. In the 21st century, the prevailing scientific worldview is naturalism. The belief that nature is all there is and all there has ever been. Oh, that's real smart. You mean that we just are here because? Yeah, pretty much. Naturalism, you see, friends, is more of a denial of creation. It's more than a denial of creation. It's a denial of God's sovereign rule. One writer who understands this is this fuzzy-headed guy named Philip Pullman. The best. Anybody heard of Philip Pullman? Anybody? Yeah, he was a best-selling children's author who should have a thousand millstones put around his neck. Uh, he, he wrote books for children explicitly to encourage them not to believe in God, not to believe in Jesus Christ. To to to, to he he his whole point was to write books that would get children not to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And one way he does this is by denying that God is the creator. And uh, in the Amber Spyglass, one of Pullman's uh, angels says this, the authority of God, it, it, it spoke just like this, the authority of God, the creator, the Lord, Yahweh, El Adonai, the king, Father, uh, the Father, the Almighty, those were all names he gave himself. He was never the creator. He was an angel like ourselves. The first angel, true, the most powerful, perhaps, but he was formed of dust, as we are. And dust is only a name for what happens when matter begins to understand itself. The first angels condensed out of a dust. And the authority was the first of all. He told those who came after him that he had created them, but it was a lie. This is what he's teaching children. It was not a lie, of course. But the absolute truth, according to Genesis 1.1, is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now everything in the entire universe is stamped with the inscription, made by God. You thought it was made in China, but it's made by God. And that fact alone gives God the right to claim his kingly authority over every single person in the world, including every single person in this room this morning. The only way to escape his authority is to reject his teaching, the teaching of Psalm 24, as Phil, uh, Philip Pullman has done, and to deny that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas. The fact that God is ruler of all. 
is essential to the entire meaning of this psalm. Psalm 24 ends with God's entrance into Jerusalem. Now, however, the God of Israel is not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the whole earth. So the psalm begins with his cosmic kingship. And the entrance of the glorious king is an event of universal significance. Why? Because the whole wide world is his dominion. Amen? If God is the king of all creation... Think about it. Then everyone owes him their allegiance. Oh, well, I don't believe that way. I'm not. Well, you still owe him your allegiance, even if you don't believe that way. Tough beans. However, you know, what, what happens is David raises an important question in verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place, meaning God's holy temple? To put it another way, who has permission to enter the royal court to have an audience with the king? The second stand explains who's worthy. He who has clean, clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Well, to come into the presence of the king, what must everyone have? Clean hands and a pure heart. How many of us have clean hands and a pure heart? Don't be too fast to raise that hand. Clean hands doesn't ref... Okay, yes, I think most of you probably washed your hands this morning. You know if you went to the... Never mind. Clean hands doesn't refer to personal hygiene or even ritual purity. That's not what it refers to. But it refers to keeping God's commands. A pure heart. Pure heart obviously refers to the life of the soul so that... God requires an inward integrity as well as an outward obedience. It's kind of like you got to walk your talk. You got to be consistent inside and out. The second half of verse 4 forbids idolatry requiring and and it requires that you tell the truth. Idolatry has to do with worshiping God, and truth-telling concerns human relationships. So this verse is about what? Loving God and loving your neighbor. And thus there are four requirements for meeting the king. Only a person who has both outward obedience and inward integrity, who loves both God and neighbor. Verse 5a says, this is the person who will receive blessing from the Lord. Aren't you glad you came this morning to hear that you ain't got no hope? I did it again. Oh, amazing. I know, I know. It's problematic. Thank you for putting up with me. Do you know... It is interesting. Uh, who can possibly meet the royal standard that's put forth in this psalm and thus gain entrance into the, the, the presence of the king? Well, there's a clue in verse 5. He will receive what? Righteousness from God his Savior. To receive righteousness means to vindicate. So this verse is about justification, about being declared righteous in God's sight. So there's the question, so the question becomes, on what basis can anyone be justified before God? You know, at first, verse 4 seems to teach justification by works, doesn't it? That if I'm good enough then maybe God will accept me into his kingdom. I ain't killed nobody. Maybe God will accept me into his kingdom. No, the person God vindicates is someone who has clean hearts and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. And it sounds as if God vindicates a person for doing what is right. But of course, no one can meet that standard perfectly. Not 
even my wife. It's amazing. But verse 5, the, the last few words of verse 5, uh, it's, the last few words of verse 5 say, uh, he will receive, well, verse 5 says, he will receive from the Lord in righteousness from the God of his salvation, from God his Savior, the person who may ascend to God's, the, may ascend God's holy hill, still needs a Savior from sin. He or she is not justified by his or her own good deeds, but by God's saving work. Now, there's an old Scottish theologian named David Dixon who said the holy life of the true believer is not the cause of his justification before God, but he shall receive justification and eternal life as a free gift from God by virtue of the covenant of grace. Therefore, it is said here that he shall receive righteousness from the God of his salvation. Sinners can only be justified by God and God alone who saves. And when his righteousness is imputed to us and he takes from us our sin, that is when we can ascend his, into his presence. It's important to remember, though, that something is, that's not mentioned in Psalm 24, but is essential to understanding this. Namely, that when the Israelites went up to the temple in Jerusalem, they always took a sacrifice with them. Now, God's law demanded that the removal of guilt had to take place through an offering of a perfect animal, a substitute for sin. Every day, the priests would offer two perfect lambs, one in the morning and one in the evening, so that no one ever entered into the presence of God without an acceptable sacrifice. Now, this remains true for Christians who worship today. What? Really? Yeah, the requirements for entering into God's royal presence haven't changed at all. The only people who are permitted to approach the throne are those who have, what? Outward obedience and inward integrity, who love God and love other people. The only way to meet those requirements is to be justified by faith Believing in the God who saves, trusting in Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for sin. When he imputes his righteousness to us and takes, his, takes our sin upon himself. That's what happened when he died on the cross. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, It's possible that you are saying, I shall never enter into the kingdom of God, for I have neither clean hands nor a pure heart. Look then to Christ, who has already climbed the holy hill. He has entered as the forerunner of those who trust him, follow in his footsteps and repose upon his merit. He rides triumphantly into heaven, and you shall ride there too if you trust in him. But how can I get the character described, say you? The Spirit of God will give you. The Spirit of God will give you that. He will create in you a new heart. And a right spirit. Faith in Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit. And has all virtues wrapped up in it. Now the psalm's climax comes in a final stanza. David's uh, asserted that God's rule over all creation uh, is, is indeed a fact. And he's explained that uh, who has the right to enter into his royal presence. And now the king comes into his glory. Throw open the gates. Open the portals wide. The, the, the everlasting king of kings is about to enter, enter the king of glory. And the last stanza of Psalm 24 is in a form of a dialogue. To understand what's happening, for, for those of you who are historians, people who are into English history, you may remember an old English tradition. According to the ancient custom, when the king of England entered the city the city of London, through the temple bar, a servant would herald out his approach. And the herald would stand outside the city wall and demand entrance in the king's name. Open the gate! And then the royal party would hear the re re response from within. Who's there? To which the herald would answer, the king of England. And then the gates would swing open and the king would enter the city and receive this magnificent royal welcome from his loyal subjects. 
The scene in Psalm 24 is very similar. The psalm is antiphonal, a song with a call and a response, much like we do when we do our call to worship. In David's day, it would have been sung by choirs of, of Levites and perhaps a few soloists. It must have been something like this. First, the choir sang outside the city gates, calling on behalf of their triumphant king. Verse 7, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. But before the gates could be opened, the gatekeeper had to, to be certain of the king's royal identity. And so in verse 8, he would say, who is the king of glory? The heralds replied, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. And by this time, the royal choir was starting to get impatient, so they repeated their summons. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. As the giant doors swung open, the gatekeeper re repeated his question, not because he, he really was hard of hearing or wanted to cause problems, but because he wanted to hear the news again. Verse 10, who is he, this king of glory? Together they all sang, the Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. Whether or not this is exactly how the parts were divided, the main point of Psalm 24 is that the Lord of creation is the king of of all glory. This was revealed when the Ark of the Covenant was brought up into Jerusalem. It was revealed in the more magnificent way when Jesus uh, made his royal entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But even that celebration was only an anticipation of a more triumphal entry, a triumphal entry at Jesus' glorious ascension into heaven. And it was the ascension of Jesus Christ that George Friedrich Handel had in mind when he composed music for Psalm 24 in the Messiah. After his crucifixion and, and resurrection, Jesus greeted Mary Magdalene in the, in the garden. But he gave her this warning in John 29, 17. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father to my God and your God. Jesus was speaking about his reunion with the heavenly father, his entrance into glory. Although the Bible doesn't offer a full description of that royal entrance, we're given some glimpses of that glory. You can read it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, where we're told God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. The name that the Father gave the Son was the very name mentioned in Psalm 24, the name Lord, which signifies that Jesus Christ is the supreme God and ruler over all. According to Hebrews 1.3, when Jesus returned to heaven, he took his seat on a majestic throne. After making purification for sins, he, Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the majesty uh, on high. And, and then Ephesians 1.20 20 and 21 summarizes all of this, saying, God the Father seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Amen? See, these and other New Testament passages provide us hints of the transcendent exaltation of Jesus Christ. But perhaps the clearest description that we have comes from the Old Testament. In his sermon on Psalm 24, John Newton said, We conceive of him, Jesus... Be, therefore, from this sublime passage as ascending to his Father and our Father, to his God and our God, accompanied with a train of worshiping angels who demand admittance for the Messiah, the Savior, the friend of sinners, the King of glory. We can imagine as the risen Christ approached the gates of heaven that perhaps the angels sang of Psalm 24, Lift up your heads, O you gates! Be lifted up, O ancient doors, the king of glory, that the king of glory may come in. See, if the gatekeepers had asked, who is the king of glory? They would have responded, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, 
mighty in battle. For on the cross and in the grave, Jesus had done battle with sin, with death, with Satan. He'd been strong and mighty in battle, breaking the stranglehold of sin and gaining victory over all of the powers of hell. Colossians 2.15 tells us, in, uh, tells us uh, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, as the conquering hero, it was his right to enter the heavenly city as the king of glory. Now, can you imagine what it was like when God, the very Son, having finished His work of salvation on God-forsaken earth and that God-forsaken cross, enters into this glorious heaven above where He's welcomed back into the embrace of His Father? Think of this. In the words of one commentator, these verses picture the scene when after spoiling the powers of darkness and after abolishing death itself, the resurrected God-man, the Lord, returns to heaven in triumph. And as he approaches the heavenly portals, the celestial herald cries out, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. The angelic watchers within ask, who is the king of glory? The answer, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Friends, there is one final place where Jesus Christ needs to make his royal entrance. One final place. And here it is important to understand that, that not everyone who sings God's praises receives him as king. Am I right? Psalm, Palm Sunday is the perfect example. On the first day of the week, while the priests were singing in Psalm 24, the whole city welcomed Jesus in as king. However, by the end of the week, what were they doing? These same people were calling for his crucifixion. It isn't enough to simply say that Jesus Christ is the king of glory. Friends, you must enthrone him upon your heart. You must make him the king of your life. If you aren't a Christian, Jesus now stands outside the gates. And he isn't simply hoping to gain entrance. Friends, he is demanding it. He's doing it at this very moment. He's saying, open your heart. Receive my grace. Let the king of glory in. And Jesus is persistent because he keeps on knocking, doesn't he? He keeps on making his presence known. I heard that. He refuses to turn away. Jesus refuses to turn away from your heart. He remains at the gate saying, turn away from sin. Trust in my word. Trust in my gospel. Receive me as the Savior and King. And some may ask, who is this King? <laughs> and you know the answer. He is the Lord. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for sinners, who triumphed over death through the empty tomb, and who now reigns in glory as the King of heaven and earth. Friends, I'd urge you, open your hearts. Open the gates of your hearts. Let the King of glory in. This world has enough trouble. There are enough problems in this world. Aren't you sick of it? <laughs> Give your heart to the King of glory. It sure makes all the difference in the world. It has for me. It will for you. Oh, Heavenly Father, Thank you for these precious friends. And thank you, O oh Lord, for the treasure of your word that brings us such good news of great joy that we might welcome the King of glory in. O oh Lord, take now our hearts in your hands that you might rule and reign over our lives as you well deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As the choir is making their way back up here, we're going to stand and sing our closing hymn, number 301, We Will Glorify. We will 
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna. Wave those palms. Come on. I'm not letting you out of here. I know we're late. <laughs> Who's the king of glory? Jesus. Jesus is the king of glory. Hallelujah. And now receive these words. The Lord your God is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Go therefore, dear friends, as ones who are greatly loved, as ones to whom the Lord has promised to never leave you or forsake you, the one who empowers you and gives you strength to burn brightly with his light and love. May you go with great confidence and courage, knowing that this Lord of lords and King of kings is with you. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>